Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, where we care about building a better economy, government, and society for Hawaii along with everyone else. Now, I want to welcome you today to the new year. What a great opportunity for us to grow and learn in 2016. And no better way to do that than to take one of the issues that we talk about quite a bit and get updated, and that's the Jones Act. I have with me today Michael Hansen, president of the Hawaii Shippers Council, whom I think is probably one of the leading experts in knowledge about the Jones Act. He's been working on that for quite a while, trying to update the Jones Act for Hawaii and for the nation. Please welcome to our program, Michael Hansen. Michael, aloha. Thank you, uh, Kaylee, for having me on the show. It's good to be back here. Yes. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's 2016. I've got a question for you. Sure. Do we still have the Jones Act? Absolutely. Absolutely. How long have we had the Jones Act? Uh, we've had the Jones Act for nearly 100 years. Well, I may have lost some of our viewers already because not everybody in the world knows what the Jones Act is. I know you're very familiar with it. So l let's just assume that we've got some viewers here who are tuning in for the first time what is this thing we call the Jones Act? The, the Jones Act is a, a piece of legislation uh, that was Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. So back in 1920, the United States federal government passed this law. Right. What does this law do? The law is restricts uh, domestic shipping okay. to vessels that were built in the United States, uh, are flying the U.S. flag, employing U.S. crew, are owned by U.S. citizens and managed by U.S. citizens. Okay, so basically it has these requirements for any ships in the domestic trade. Exactly. And that means ships that go between U.S. ports, is that right? Exactly. So it's not talking about ships coming from a foreign port and just stopping once at a U.S. It, port. It's a domestic shipping law. It has no effect on the foreign trade of the United okay. States. Okay, uh, until a ship actually hits an Amer American port and then goes to another American port. Yes, a foreign flagship can go from okay. one American port to another All right. uh, without, without any real restrictions. And it can discharge foreign cargo and it, uh, to the U.S., cargo that was loaded sure. at a foreign port mm -hmm. and discharged to the a U.S. port. And it can load export cargo from the U.S. port and take that, of course, overseas sure. to a foreign country. But we're really but not it, talking it, about yeah, that. But it, that ship cannot carry cargo from one U.S. port to another. Got it. That is, the, that is the trade that is restricted only to Jones Act qualified ships. Okay, so let's review th those qualifications necessary. In order for a ship to carry cargo back and forth between two American ports, like right. Honolulu and Los Angeles or San Francisco, it has to meet four basic criteria according right. to the Jones Act. And what were they again? The vessel has to be built in the United States. Okay. And, and I would imagine that would probably be one of the most significant, if not the most significant factor. Uh, that is the, uh, the largest cost driver All right. okay. in, in, the, in the Jones Act uh, shipping world. So built in the United States. It built in the United States and never rebuilt in a foreign okay. place. All right. Okay. It's got to be U.S. flag. All right. Flying the U.S. flag. Uh, employing basically a citizen crew. All right. Be owned by U.S. citizens. Okay. And, uh, n and uh, then managed by U a U.S. citizen. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question, uh, and I don't, just want to get a, a very short answer because we can come back later on and, and go into this in depth. What is the difficulty for us in Hawaii of this law? What problem does it create? Well, the Jones Act... Uh, because of the U.S. build okay. requirement. In other words, we have to get our ships from shipyards in the United States. Constructed but, but by we, shipyards we, in the United States. We yeah. can't use ships built elsewhere if we're going to be involved in, in that trade between the domestic American trade, ports. Yeah, the okay. domestic trade. And, what, what and the, thing, the thing that you'll find that, uh, for example, uh, there are similar kinds of rules to the Jones Act for aviation sure. and for road trucks and also for railroads. All right. And this general category is known as cabotage. All right. Now, so that's, this a, is, that's a French word, isn't it? it it's actually starts... It sounds like sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> it actually starts as, as, a, as a Portuguese word. There you go, Portuguese. Cabo, meaning point. All right. And uh, sailing between the capes 
was a cabotur in French. All right, there you go. And then the term cabotage came into place. So like saboteur, sabotage, cabotur, and, cabotage. And the um, and the meaning the the meaning of cabotage is the right to engage in domestic trade. Okay. So the and now, and now, for, now, now, for example, uh -huh. if we look at aviation cabotage, sure. uh, airlines are permitted to uh, uh, acquire foreign manufactured aircraft, for example, Airbus. The Hawaiian Airlines fleet, for example, flies a lot of Airbuses. They purchase those aircraft, import them to the United States, flag them U.S., put a U.S. air crew on there, and operate them as a U.S. airline. And that's completely legal. And in the case of shipping, uh, the shipping, uh, we're looking at this very old law that requires the ships be built in the United States. The problem with that is that uh, U.S. shipbuilding has declined to a point where it's not competitive at all. All right. And we're paying for a large ocean-going ship of the kind that service Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico, uh, you're looking at a vessel that will cost four to five times what it would cost if you had the ship built in South Korea, for okay, example. Okay, so basically, just to sum up so far, this Jones Act law has resulted in more expensive ships in use for, in our what, what, what trade. It's, yeah, what it's resulted in is an artificial scarcity, scarcity of, of large ocean-going ships in the United States' so domestic trades. Basic economics, when there's and, a scarcity, the, the prices, cost of it goes up. Prices go up. So it's, it's supply and demand. It costs us a lot more to use these authorized ships under the Jones Act than to purchase one well, outside yeah. the Jones Act. Not only does the high cost of construction drive up uh, the cost that, that the shipping company has to, to repay that amount of money sure. over time, uh, but it also reduces the construction of new ships because they are so expensive. Okay. It depresses new building construction. And as a result of that, you come up with a scarcity. So then at a rubber hits the road level for places that are dependent upon shipping, especially like our territory of Puerto Rico or Hawaii, the state that is surrounded by water. What Alaska. happens? And Alaska. What happens to the economy? How are people impacted by this? Well, this, uh, this uh, it's impacted in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways in which it's, uh, the effect of this is, uh, is, can be demonstrated is that it, it's, it's like a broad tax over the entire economy. Because we feel the cost of shipping in almost everything we have everything in Hawaii, we do. from housing materials to the eggs we buy, to the milk we have, sure. to the animal feed for and, the cattle and so right. forth. And in addition to that, um, because there, there isn't a great deal of diversity in, in, the, in the vessel types in the Jones Act fleet, you're basically looking at container ships and the product tankers. And as a result, we don't have at our disposal the kinds of ships that would better facilitate an economy. For example, a dry bulk carrier All that right. could have brought feed and grain to Hawaii and lowered the cost. So we're really at a disadvantage because in addition to the scarcity of land in Hawaii in the first place that drives up housing sure. costs, in addition to our isolation and dependence upon shipping, the Jones Act itself is a factor in raising the cost of living sure. here in Hawaii. Right. Let me ask you this question. Does it, do we get impacted proportionately far more than some of the landlocked states? In, in the uh, United yeah, states? The, uh, the so-called non-contiguous mm -hmm. jurisdictions of the United States, those are the, juris those are the political jurisdictions of the United States that are not connected to the 48 contiguous states. And that would include Alaska, Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Okay. Now, Mike, and they're all dependent upon I ocean see. shipping. Many people think that because Alaska is part of the North American continent, that perhaps there is some overland transportation, but there really isn't. Alaska is completely dependent upon 
ocean shipping for its surface okay. for its surface transportation. Now, I would imagine that trying to isolate what causes our prices to rise in Hawaii or to go up is a very difficult thing because the economy is so full of interconnected factors. But right. are there some studies that have tried to measure the economic impact of the Jones Act on us here in Hawaii? Actually, there isn't. Okay. Yeah. We're lacking the data in some ways. Yes. I mean, I've made some estimates, uh -huh. but uh, they're certainly not a rigorous um, uh, academic study. In, in fact, there, there's quite a broad range in estimates out there in the general media. For example, right. sometimes even up to a 30% factor which, is quoted, sometimes which, which, 5%. Which, which, which couldn't possibly be true. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, if you look at the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis, that's a federal bureau, um, and it's uh, the, the number that local economists here use pretty widely, sure. it, it indicates that the, the cost of living in, or the, the costs of living in Hawaii is approximately 15.2% greater than the U.S. average. And so you're starting at that point in terms of, of what the additional cost is. <laughs> now, Michael, if the Jones Act contributes to the cost of living in Hawaii, why hasn't the state or why hasn't industry in Hawaii commissioned a study to see exactly what that cost increase is because of the Jones Act? Why don't we have this done? Uh, because I was going to get back to the, um, the cost differentials. Um, but it's interesting, if you look at the USDA, the U United sure. U.S. Department of Agriculture study, they've found the cost of meals at home in Hawaii is 40% higher than the U.S. average. So there's a lot more in just food than there is the general average. Mm. So that's something to look at. Um, in terms of why hasn't there been a real study done, the uh, shipping industry, the domestic shipping industry, otherwise known as the, as the Jones Act industry, is opposed to doing any studies. I see. So if there are any government uh, agencies or if any com commercial entities are um, defending the Jones Act, it's not likely that we're going to see a study done to, to show right. the, the cost of living. Back in the, in the late 90s, uh, we actually um, uh, had a, a, p a piece of legislation introduced that would have uh, authorized and funded a study. Well, that would be something very useful. We're going to take a quick break, and, and when we return, I'm going to ask Michael to help us to give the other side a fair shake, so to speak. Michael is promoting reform of the Jones Act, but when we get back from a break, I'd like him to address some of the arguments that are put forth for keeping the Jones Act exactly as it is. This is Kaylee Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii program. Ehana Kako will be right back after this short message. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on Think Tech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I want to encourage you to take a look sometime at the Grassroot Institute website. We've got several articles on the Jones Act. Just go there and search for Jones Act. And many of them are written by my guest today, Michael Hansen, the president of the Hawaii Shippers Council, who's also a scholar at the Grassroot Institute, providing a lot of information that few people actually have. When we come back from another break, I'm going to ask Michael to share with you some of the things that are taking place to reform the Jones Act, to bring about change. But first, let's look at this question. Mike, there are people who defend the Jones Act. Our congressional delegation generally does. Our, our state uh, 
government frequently does, uh, political leaders in the, the leading political party, the Democrats do. What is perhaps the strongest argument put forth in defense of keeping the Jones Act the way it is? Okay, there's a number of different defenses that are offered for the Jones Act. Um, one of the, um, probably the, um, <clears throat> an important reason is that uh, they're trying to defend the U.S. jobs on board the ship. Okay, preserving the jobs. And that, and that really is, is the seamen that are sailing on board the ship. Mm -hmm. And it's a relatively small number of people. And um, that's really uh, in defense of the flag requirement. Now, when you say and flag requirement, these would be uh, American sailors for the most part. Sure, but one, once you fly an American flag on a ship, uh -huh. once you register a ship in the United States, then you're under the obligation of hiring a U.S. crew All right. and uh, maintaining U.S. citizen ownership of it and uh, uh, maintaining U.S. management. Now, isn't a significant rationale for that uh, the need to uh, to commandeer these sailors at, uh, for military purposes during times of war. Right. That's that's the national defense. Okay. okay. But in terms of the, the jobs uh, themselves. But, yeah. But in, ter in terms of the flag requirement, requiring a U.S. flagship to operate between U.S. to carry cargo and passengers between U.S. ports, that is to preserve the U.S. jobs on board the ship, and also to say that. Because this is domestic transportation, it's the purview of the uh, domestic workforce, now, which, is, which is understandable. It's, it's like, uh, for example, the aircraft that mm -hmm. fl fly between the West Coast and Hawaii. They've got, those are U.S. Uh, uh, planes employing U.S. crew members. All right. N along now, with that, is there also a concern for the jobs that are employed in the shipbuilding industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a different uh, kettle of fish. The uh, rationale for most of the shipbuilding is national security. Mm -hmm. And there's three parts to the national security uh, argument. Uh, the first being uh, the shipbuilding industrial base of the United States. All right. Maintaining the capacity to build ships in time of war, All in right. times of national emergency. Uh, this is uh, many times looked upon in the same way that we built the fleets during World War II to win that conflict. However, um, it's, a, it's a difficult argument to make uh, even in comparison to World War II because even in that, at that time, uh, most of the ships that were built for World War II, not the combatant ships, but the transports, were built in shipyards that were created specifically for that purpose. For example, Henry J. Kaiser built brand new shipyards All in right. order to turn out Liberty ships. Uh, the second argument in the national defense is the one where it's called uh, sea lift capacity. Right. And this is having U.S. flagships available to carry uh, the, the men and materiel to overseas conflicts. And uh, that particular uh, requirement, the sea lift capacity, there are so few ships in the U.S. Jones Act fleet today that it's unlikely that any, any one of them would be requisitioned for such a, for, for an overseas contingency. Sure. Because they're, because they're in demand for what they're doing currently mm -hmm. within the domestic economy. And isn't it the case that currently our military acquires ships built outside of the United States to enhance its sea lift capacity? Yeah, there's a, there's a group of ships, uh, there's 79 of them, as we, mm -hmm. as we, as we sit here. And uh, that, it's called the U.S. Flag International Trade right. Fleet. And that uh, group of ships is 100% foreign built and the military has no problem with that. Sure, because they, were, they could not afford to pay for U.S. built ships. So they get an economic advantage. And the, and the, the yeah. lower costing ships. Right. And so mm -hmm. the U.S. built requirement 
is it doesn't exist okay. for that. And there was a third argument you were going. The to third make. argument is uh, having the mariners, all right, the trained seamen mm -hmm. that are available to man ships in the time of war. Okay, now before going on to another issue, what would your response be to to this uh, objection to changing the Jones Act? Well, the first place is that uh, our shipbuilding capacity today is so small that it could not respond in any meaningful way to a major conflict. We w you would either have to acquire foreign-built ships or you would have to do the same thing that was done in World right. War II. Okay. So you're uh, saying that this is not a significant argument in the, in the long run. Right. It affects such a small uh, amount Look of... The capacity is so small. Mm -hmm. We've only got three uh, shipyards that are building large ocean-going commercial ships at the present time. All right. And their capacity is, is uh, quite limited. They're turning out approximately two to three ships per year. And they have done that for now for 20 or 30 years. So it's not a large number of ships. For example, uh, Japan builds over 200 such ships for export, not for use inside Japan, but for export every year. Korea's building something on the on the <coughs> on the average of 400 ships a year now these are two of our allies sure and and those numbers 400 ships or 70 ships how do they compare to what we're actually producing i just said we're producing two to three two to three yeah. I, I heard you say that but i wanted to hear you again because and there's it's hard to believe yeah there's <laughs> there's uh there's um there's 89 ships in the jones act fleet uh-huh and there's 79 ships in the, so in the U.S. flag international trade fleet, which are all foreign built. But if you look at the, if you put them all together, Japan, which is, there's three major shipbuilding countries today, Japan, South Korea, and China. All right. The smallest one is in Japan. They build more ships in one year, ocean going ships for export than we have in our fleet. So the idea that we're going to inflict massive damage to our national security by any alteration of the Jones Act in terms of where we get ship our building, ships yeah. from, the shipbuilding, uh, is, is really, there's really no weight to that argument. That's correct, except it has an emotional tug to it. I can And for people that. who don't understand the issues, mm -hmm. you know, gee whiz, we better keep it there because... What's another argument offered well, in defense the, of the, the, keeping it the same? Well, uh, anyway, the... Uh, if there were to be a major conflict, sure. it would likely be decided by intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's right. ICBMs. Not a comfortable <laughs> thing to talk about. <laughs> but it, but, it, but it, would, it would make the issue the, of shipbuilding mute, wouldn't the, it? The co conflict would be over by the time <laughs> we got our ships mobilized. <laughs> so, I mean... Now, it, it, so it, you, so uh -huh. the, on the national defense side, you've got the ship in, uh, shipbuilding industrial base ish, uh, argument. Mm -hmm. You've got the sea lift capacity argument. Sea lift, we have so few Jones Act ships in service right now that if we were to requisite, if the government were to requisition ships for war effort, that would leave, say, for example, Hawaii mm -hmm. without sufficient number of container ships to carry the cargo. And I don't think that's going to happen. For example, in World War I, when the government did requisition many of the steamers, Hawaii, among other places, was short of ships. And lo and behold, the government issued waivers for foreign flag ships to operate on a, on a, a continuous basis between Hawaii and California, or the West Coast. Well, you've written on this, in fact, for those uh, in our viewership here today who listening to Michael Hansen, uh, you can see many of his articles uh, at the Grassroot Institute website, grassrootinstitute.org, in, in which he talks about why some of the arguments in favor of keeping the Jones Act the same uh, really don't carry a lot of weight. But I'd like to switch gear for a moment. Sure. Um, it, it, very often, those people who want to change the Jones Act, and we'll talk about it in the next segment, ways to do that, sometimes have misconceptions as to how it works, and, and you've been very helpful in, in exposing those misconceptions and helping to, to update our thinking. Well, what's a common misconception about the way the Jones Act uh, works? A very common misconception here in Hawaii, at least, um, is, and it's also, uh, I've heard the same thing um, elsewhere, 
is that the Jones Act somehow restricts the foreign trade of the United States in respect of Hawaii. In, in other words, the Jones Act, according to this misconception, prohibits, uh, prohibits foreign ships from calling, ca calling upon our ports. And, and okay, and what's the truth? It doesn't at all. The Jones Act is a domestic shipping law, and it has no effect on the foreign trade of the United States. No legal effect upon yeah. that. So if ships choose not to come to Hawaii, that's an, because of an economic incentive, probably. It may sure. not be worth it to come to our market that is so small. Exactly. If they, if they weren't able to continue on to an American port after us. But there's no law itself that says they cannot do it. In fact, isn't it the case that foreign ships do come to sure. Hawaii? Absolutely. And uh, another misconception is that uh, if foreign ships do come to, uh, to, to a Hawaii port and discharge their cargo, then they must re re uh, return foreign, which is not true either. Mm. Uh, a foreign flagship can call at Honolulu and transact cargo as long as it's discharging uh, foreign cargo or loading export cargo and then proceed to other ports say, for example, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, or whatever the case may be, and transact both uh, import and export cargoes at those ports. It just, the foreign flagship just cannot carry cargo from one U.S. port to another. And that's so very important to understand we're dealing with the domestic trade. Exactly. Now, sometimes people raise questions about Passenger ships. In what ways are passenger ships affected by some of the uh, same the pa Jones the passenger, Act laws? Uh, the carriage of passengers domestically mm -hmm. is uh, controlled by a different All act right. of Congress, uh, known as the uh, Passenger Vessel Services Act of 1886. So it's not the Jones Act, actually. Right. It's another but set it, of laws. But it's invariably referred to as the Jones Act. So another the, misconception. The Jones Act is the best known of these cabotage laws. And so any cabotage law in the United States is commonly called the Jones Act. I see. But there are uh, quite a large number of laws on the books that uh, are individually not uh, and the Jones Act is just uh, Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. And so it's, uh, the, I mean, to use the term properly, it, it refers to a very small section in one law. But there's this whole group of laws. In fact, the Passenger Vessel Services Act of 1886 is often called the, the Passenger Jones Act. There you go. <laughs> For that reason. By default. Yeah. Well, you know, when we come back from a, another quick break, uh, I'd like us to deal with another misconception, and, and that is some people think that the only way we can move forward with regard to the Jones Act is to advocate a repeal of this nearly 100-year-old federal statute. But, but you have for a long time been working on something a little more modest that, that would probably have a much better chance of making it through the political waters, and we're going to talk about that. I'm talking with Michael Hansen, president of the Hawaii Shippers Council, as we get an update on the Jones Act in 2016. Don't go away, we'll be right back after this short message. Hi, I'm Chris Letham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy, and I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people are collaborating and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there. 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. Welcome back to Ehana Kako for this week. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, and my guest today is Michael Hansen. We're talking about the Jones Act. It's important to bring people from all walks of life, all points of view together in order to bring about change, and that's why at the Grassroot Institute we say, Ehana kako, and that means let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. 
And in doing so, we're deeply delighted uh, at our partnership with Think Tech Hawaii. My hat goes off to Jay Fidel, the producer, and all the workers, volunteers, and technicians. 35 hours of original content into the air and across the internet, uh, going across the world every week. Now back to our program today. Michael, again, thank you very much for being with us today and updating it's us. It's a pleasure. You know, frequently there's a, a lot of smoke and fire in, in the debate over the Jones Act, and the term repeal gets used quite a bit. I mean, it can be a rallying cry, repeal the Jones Act, that sounds uh, uh, brave and uh, calls people to action, but it could be problematic to use that term or even to attempt a repeal. Yes, I think so. Um, first of all, um, there's a, a large number of so-called cabotage or coastwise laws on the books. So when you say repeal the Jones Act, you might not get what you want if you were to repeal just the specific uh, law that's known as the Jones Act. Secondly, when you speak about repealing the Jones Act, you're talking about repealing it on a nationwide basis. And there, you're going to have an awful lot of people uh, arrayed against you. And, for example, you're talking about all the tugs and uh, the towboats and uh, river barges on the inland waterways of the United States. You know, there's uh, some for, there's, there's something on the order of uh, 35,000 of those vessels employing a large number of people. They're going to take that as a direct threat to their livelihood. And you're, you, you, you're looking at uh, all the tugs that are working in the harbors so around the U.S. If, so if our aim is really to bring down the cost of milk and eggs in Hawaii, <laughs> um, the, the strategy of re attempting to repeal this could create such an, a, a defensive response from so many different quarters that we'd never get anything. Exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's the, pr and many people use the term repeal the Jones Act in a very loose fashion. Now, you have been working on for a while, we together have been advocating a, a measure of reform that is limited that can actually result in some significant benefit w with minimal impact upon our friends in the unions and others who are in the shipping industry. And perhaps we can talk a little bit about different ways of reform. Right. What, what approach could be feasible? Yeah, there's um, the primary co cost driver in Jones Act shipping is the cost of building new self-propelled ships in the United States. And that's the, um, the, the, uh, the most effective point at which to approach this issue. So a, a new ship would cost what in comparison to being able to buy it from one of our allies outside of the Well, US? for example, the, the new ships that are being built for the Hawaii trade by, a, by the uh, Philly shipyard are said to cost $207, $208 million a piece. Okay. Uh, they're being built in, at the Philly shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Those ships were actually designed by a shipyard in South Korea. And um, if you had gone directly to the shipyard in South Korea and ordered the ship from them, built to U.S. flag standards, you would probably be paying something in the neighborhood of 40 to $50 million for that ship. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. That, that's, uh, you could get five for the price of one. Exactly. And uh, You can build out your whole fleet mm -hmm. for the price of one. It makes a big difference. Um, well, I what, what this does is that, uh, like we discussed, having such expensive shipbuilding creates a scarcity mm -hmm. of ships in the, in the trades, which drives up prices in a number of different ways. Now, that scarcity, I would imagine, has at least two impacts. One, as you just mentioned, it drives up prices because the cost of ship goods is higher, but also it, it limits free market competition. Right. It, there would be huge barriers to any competitors coming the, into the yeah, market. Th this is what the, uh, the economists call barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. uh, by having such a high buy-in price, you've got to buy a U.S. built ship to enter the market. So only the powers that be really benefit from this rather than the it, consumer. It, it keeps out the competition. 
it effectively mm -hmm. uh, reduces competition substantially. And some of that, or even the threat of competition. There you now, some of that competition could potentially be our allies themselves, foreign sh sh shipping companies, uh, who would like to get into the right. American trade. Yeah, the uh, the issue of ownership is uh, is one that's uh, uh, very difficult to deal with. Sure. Um, and if you were to uh, to reduce currently. Ownership requirements are that you have 75% citizen ownership. To reduce that or to eliminate it entirely <coughs> would be quite a difficult proposition. Sure. Now, you're not advocating that. I think that many of us together are, however, looking at a certain kind of updating or a certain kind of reform to the Jones Act that deals with the build requirement just for, for Hawaii and for the territories. Yeah, what, what we're uh, proposing is an exemption from the build requirement. Okay, so an exemption, not a repeal. Right. So the exemption would apply only to... A to Alaska, uh -huh. uh, Guam, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. So the places in the U.S. hit most severely by right. the Jones Act. So it leaves intact all the mechanisms of the Jones Act in the rest of the country. Exactly. And the related cabotage with it, we don't we won't be threatening right. the, those other industries. Yeah, and part of the, uh, the the strategy or the rationale behind taking that approach is that we are we have this same problem in common with those other jurisdictions. So you have other voices going to Washington, D.C., right. you've it's got a, Alaska, it's you've got a, the territories. It's a greater number of people that are disadvantaged by this. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, all, we're basically in the same boat, if you want to put it that way. And we're all uh, ref we're classified by the U.S. government as non-contiguous. We're non-contiguous jurisdictions. And the ocean trades are described as non-contiguous trades of the United States. Sure. So we're under the same regulatory uh, regime. So the best approach is to go in together and see if we can change it and leave the mainland trades uh, to someone else because there you're taking on too big a burden. Now, let's say that this reform is successful, that there is an exemption from the build requirement of the Jones Act so that ships in the Hawaii trade or in the trade of the territories and Alaska could uh, be purchased from our allies at a fraction of the cost. As that begins to impact the economy, I would imagine costs would go down for the consumer. Sure. What would happen to union jobs? Uh, what, what would you say to those who would object we're going to lose union jobs as a result of that. <clears throat> well, this would impact union jobs on the U.S. mainland where commercial Jones Act ships are being constructed. And that's uh, in three locations. Uh, the Philly shipyard, which, by the way, is Norwegian-owned. Uh, the um, uh, shipyard in, um, in um, Louisiana, uh -huh. or Mississippi, excuse me, where... Uh, um, some new ships for the Hawaii trade have been purchased. That one's owned by the by a Singapore company, and then General Dynamics Nazco Yard in San Diego. Now, those the, are the three okay. commercial shipyards. There's three shipyards that are building commercial ocean-going ships. And we're dealing with about how many jobs? We're uh, with it, 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 uh, the jobs are f the jobs fluctuate depending mm -hmm. upon the workload sure. in the shipyard. But we're probably looking at, say, 2,000 jobs per shipyard. Okay. Now, if we're looking at those 2,000 jobs... 6,000 total. 6,000 jobs, perhaps. Uh, when, when Detroit was under a great deal of protectionism, protected by tariffs and so forth, other barriers to cars like Toyotas and Hondas, uh, people often argued, gee, if we lift some of that protectionism, we'll lose Detroit jobs. But what we really saw happening in the auto industry was uh, a real complacency had set in, and it, it had not become com competitive. Now that the protectionism is lifted, we see a robust growth in the American auto industry. Do you think we could expect that possibly uh, from the shipping industry? It's hard to know if mm -hmm. that would happen or not. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, today, in, this, in the world today, 
that along the lines of Japan, South Korea, and China, that you not only have to build for your domestic market, you have to also be competitive and build for the international market. Sure. And I'm not sure that it would be possible to bring down uh, the cost of shipbuilding in the United States low enough to achieve that kind of a level. What is your response to those who say that, that the potential loss of 6,000 positions is, is not worth the reforming of the Jones Act? Well, the problem with that is that you're looking at, say, 6,000 jobs on the U.S. mainland versus uh, 6 million people living in the, uh, in the non-contiguous jurisdictions. And the impact upon them. That's right. It's a much larger impact. And wouldn't you also perhaps be increasing jobs for the overall related industries in ship, shipping uh, because we may, may have more activity taking place. Yeah, the, the, there's a definite possibility that the number of ships would increase, mm -hmm. which would mean there would be more jobs for the shipboard unions. Before we go, we've got a minute left. Uh, what do you think the prospects are here in Hawaii of raising some, the awareness of this, or perhaps specifically some political support for this as we go into the next legislative <coughs> session? Uh, we've introduced uh, or had uh, legislation, not legislation, but resolutions right. calling on the uh, Hawaii State Legislature to um, ask Congress and our delegation specifically uh, to facilitate uh, uh, the reform along the lines we've spoken of. And this will be uh, the fourth year. This, fourth year, in 2016. Yeah. And, uh, the, um, I think there's much broader public appreciation for the issue today and that many more uh, Hawaii state legislators know about it and that we're getting some increase in the number of, of sponsors for, that, for those resolutions. So we're hopeful that this will uh, continue to grow in the future. Well, certainly a significant part of that uh, growing awareness and support for changing and reforming the Jones Act is because of your work, Michael, at the Hawaii Shippers Council and the, your excellent work of being a clearinghouse of information sure. about the Jones Act and, and your willingness to partner with groups like the Grassroot Institute to, to sure. make a difference. And if somebody wants to follow um, the issue, they can go on the Hawaii Shippers Council Facebook page and I, good. and I post articles there almost every day. Facebook Hawaii Shippers Council. Hawaii Shippers Council. Michael, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Kaylee. My guest today, Michael Hansen, president of the Hawaii Shippers Council, is doing a great job of raising awareness about the Jones Act and promoting reform, a reform that we can live with and one that will be benefit a greater number of people here in Hawaii and across the country. Uh, for more information, do go to the Grassroot Institute website, uh, where many of Michael's writings are. And in addition to that, uh, you'll be privy then to some of our strategies working here in Hawaii and in Washington, D.C. to bring about a better Hawaii for everyone. Until next week on Ehana Kako on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network, we say aloha.